Good afternoon and welcome to this parallel session on treatment or management in one of the 10 sessions under the Clinical and Public Health Track of the first National Hospital Research Forum. So again, um, thank you everyone for att attending this particular session. So the call for abstract for this research forum resulted in the submission of 212 um, research proposal that subsequently underwent a stringent screening and selection process in this session. Um, and in this particular session, we will hear three submissions that have successfully qualified for presentation under the clinical and public health track, particularly on the treatment and management. Each of the researcher presenters in this session will have 15 minutes to present their papers. Um, this will be followed by a 10 minute question and answer portion to give the audience the opportunity to raise their questions and clarifications for each of our presenters. So we would like to remind everyone from our audience that they will be put on mute in the entire session. So should you have, um, have any clarification or questions um, regarding the research, um, you would like to request everyone to submit these um, questions through the chat box or the chat um, panel below. Um, as you can see, you may see the button at the bottom um, of the screen. So just to manage our time for the Q&A, we will be allotting a, ma a maximum of one question per presenter only. So as a process also, kindly identify first um, the the presenter whom you wish to ask, followed by the question. Towards the end of the session, we will also have a synthesis and some onward announcement in the forum program as well. So for this particular session, we will have two live um, uh, pro uh, presenters. So first would be Dr. Paolo Pinkerton Alamilio from the National Kidney and Transplant Institute with his research on outcomes on hemoperfusion versus standard therapy in dialysis patients with severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. This will be followed by Dr. Marion D. Patricio from the Philippine Heart Center with his research on the nutrition and frailty status of patients undergoing cardiovascular surgery and its association with post-operative outcomes. Um, this will be followed by a virtual presentation from Dr. Tenorio from the Batangas Medical Center with her research on the catharsis education and action method as an adjunct therapy to family planning education in the utilization of contraceptives among women of reproductive age, a randomized controlled trial. So with this, um, to our researchers, again, Thank you for joining this forum and congratulations for, for reaching um, this far into this platform and initiative. So to begin or to start the presentation, may we call on Dr. Marion D. Patricio to present his research. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Elenilia. I'm here to present about uh, my research entitled Outcomes of Imperfusion versus Standard Therapy in Severe COVID at NKTI. So these are my co-authors, Dr. Dangilan, Dr. Arakama, and Dr. Chua. So uh, COVID-19 pandemic has catastrophic effects in CKD more than any other population, I think. So CKD has increased risk for infection, has uh, increased risk for disease severity because of advancing age, multiple comorbidities, and have immune dysfunction related to dialysis and the disease condition and malnutrition. So they usually have uh, highest risk for hospital death compared to the non-dialysis population. And uh, increasing stage of CKD is, a common, is associated with increasing risk for mortality. So most of the repurposed drugs and new drug treatments available for COVID-19 have some contraindication or were, were not 
tested on dialysis patients. So we propose that uh, hemoperfusion, since they're already dialyzing, you can just connect the hemoperfusion cartridge to the dialysis machine as a treatment for the CKD patients. So in CKD, as you will see there, the manifestations for severe COVID are more systemic, suggesting a cytokine release syndrome. That's why hemoperfusion was proposed. So just a review of uh, pathophysiology of cytokine release syndrome, there's usually a cycle of pro-inflammation, pro uh, then followed by imminent exhaustion, and then distal organ damage. So this cytokine storm leads to capillary syndrome, which leads to progressive lung injury and ARDS. So hemoperfusion studies in critical illness showed improvement in oxygenation and vasopressors, reduction in inflammatory markers, and a decrease in predicted mortality. So there are many clinical trials for the use of hemoperfusion. Uh, actually, there are conflicting results. Most um, earlier studies uh, advised benefit, but uh, later studies uh, said that we need to have more considerations before using hemoperfusion. However, in our population, which doesn't have other treatment modalities available, uh, we propose hemoperfusion because it has already established safety in CKD. So just a figure, uh, usually the potential of, of severe COVID is, um, starts with the uh, upper respiratory symptoms, may progress to a pneumonia. During this period, usually during the, between the first and second week, you will find the non the cytokine release syndrome, and this is the appropriate time where when we initiate the hemoperfusion treatment. So during cytokine peak, as you can see on this uh, um, on this diagram, we wanted to give the hemoperfusion, and sometimes we offered CRRT and other forms of dialysis to mitigate the effects of cytokine storm. So all in all, this will lead to endothelial protection and additional organ support therapy. Usually this supports the liver, the kidneys, and the lungs. So for my study objectives, we wanted to compare the 20 day mortality of the ALS patients given hemoperfusion versus those who did not receive hemoperfusion or receive standard medical therapy only. Other sub objectives, baseline de demographics, other therapies, uh, before and after change of inflammatory markers and secondary outcomes. So this is the methodology we followed. During the study period, we identified 436 patients with confirmed COVID. 200, approximately 250 presented with multilobar infiltrates, suggestive of severe or critical COVID-19. And among those patients, we, I identified 40 patients who received hemoperfusion. After applying the exclusion criteria, we excluded nine patients due to post kidney transplant status, three of them having only AKI and four with incomplete records. So we only choose those patients on maintenance dialysis or are in need of maintenance dialysis or are already classified as end stage kidney disease for this study. After that, we did the matching. So we did an exhaust exhaustive matching. Uh, category, so we match the age and gender comorbidities, the type of dialysis, uh, HD, or hemodialysis, or PD, or peritoneal dialysis, and the degree of X-ray involvement to match those with, uh, with those given in perfusion. So all these patients are classified as severe or critical COVID. So additional selection criteria, they must be positive for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR or gene expert, they have severe category or critical category and other laboratory findings suggestive of hypercytokinemia, as you can see here. So uh, we use statistics to summarize demographics, and then we use uh, the variables between each main control groups. So we use the man with me test and uh, chi-square and Fisher exact test for the categorical variables. All in all, we use the Wilcoxin rank test to do the before and after analysis of the inflammatory markers after four hemoperfusion sessions. And then um, we, from the significant uh, factors that we identified that may be predictive of mortality, 
completed simple logistic regression followed by multiple logistic, logistic regression analysis to see if they can be useful as predictors of mortality. So all in all, sorry for the table, it's quite um, small. But as you can see here in table one, baseline demographics and clinical profile of the patient. So just wanted to show you that the age, the dialysis modality, the comorbidities, type of dialysis are equal between the groups. Uh, at presentation, the hemoperfusion group had more desaturation, had more fever, and had more hypotension as compared to the control group. Uh, based on the inflammatory markers, the hemoperfusion group also preferentially had higher, higher uh, baseline inflammatory markers than control. So actually those who were given hemoperfusion are the sickest of our patients already because we used that treatment early on as salvage therapy for those who are not responding to initial therapy. Uh, I have I skipped some tables, but this is the uh, uh, table on the before and after analysis of the uh, inflammatory markers and the respiratory uh, respiratory physiology of the patient. So as you can see, after the fourth hemoperfusion session in the hemoperfusion group, there was significant reduction in LDH, HSCRP, ferritin, and procalcitonin, and significant improvement. From 174 to 278 of uh, the PF ratio or the oxygenation of the patients. This corresponds to reduction in the use of, of ventilators and high flow nasal O2 and use of oxygen. So, all in all, the outcome was the overall 28 mortality in severe and critical COVID is almost at 50%, it's very high. So as I say, as I was saying, the patient is, the patient group is all very vulnerable to the disease. So there was uh, 11 patients from the hemoperfusion group expired compared to 35, 37 patients or 54% in the control group. So there, so there was no differences in terms of number of hospital days, number of days on ventilators and number of days of on face mask between the groups. So our study found a significant benefit in the use of hemoperfusion in terms of 20 day mortality and the significant reduction in inflammatory markers and significant improvement in respiratory function in dialysis patients with severe and critical COVID-19. So um this is comparable to the earlier studies done at China, although this was a preprint, but they also showed mortality benefits with the use of hemoperfusion versus standard therapy alone. So more recent studies, however, only small sample sizes, they used jaffron and cytosol and oxidase membrane to as a hemoperfusion as well, which compared outcomes of uh, those given perfusion versus those not given human perfusion. And they also found, aside from benefit to mortality, there's also increased ICU stay as compared to control as compared to controls. So these are just some of the other studies which which showed mortality benefit. Actually the there's a uh, improvement in the use of vasopressors found in other studies, but we don't we didn't see this in our study and improvement in PF ratio, similar to other studies, uh, which we also observe in our patients. However, since during that time we employed the test-based strategy before we can discharge the patients because dialysis patients need the negative RT-PCR before they can be reintegrated back to their outpatient dialysis clinics, uh, we observed that there was no uh, difference in the hospital stay and additional use of oxygen because the patient stayed longer because you're waiting for them to have a negative result. So for my con conclusion among the maintenance dialysis patients with, with severe and critical COVID-19, each between was associated with a significant decrease in inflammatory markers, PF, improvement PM ratio and reduction in 20 day mortality. So there's a 2.5 lower odds of mortality compared to controls. 
in our cohort of patients. So just for policy recommendations, so there are a lot of hospitals using hemoperfusion, but this is not under a clinical trial or other study. So we propose to have a registry which summarizes all this uh, use in those with patients with AKI alone or those patients with just severe cytokine storm without need for dialysis. Uh, we wanted to have a registry so that we can uh, really analyze the data if used in, in the general population, just aside from our dialysis population. Uh, next is that uh, the, the inflammatory markers are proving to be prognostic. Higher inflammatory markers are corresponding to more severe disease and higher risk for mortality. So if the inflammatory markers are more widely available, even before we refer to specialty institutions, we can identify patients earlier who may be benefit from hemoperfusion because not all patients benefit from hemoperfusion. Only those we identify to have really high levels of cytokines or really they fit the category of cytokine release syndrome. Those are the patients who benefit from hemoperfusion therapy. <clears throat> So with that also, we can also identify those we can assign to novel therapies, uh, most, of the, most of them under clinical trials. So at least we can enroll, this, we can enroll those patients who have, who have failure to respond to initial therapies to more appropriate or novel therapies for severe COVID-19. These are my references, and that's all for my um, report. Right. Thank you, Dr. Alamilio. So I think, um, JJ, if I'm correct, we will be calling on the next um, presenter first before we go on to the Q&A. Yes, um, I will yeah. present Dr. Uh, Dr. Marlon Patricio Slayen. All right. Thank you. So now, um, for our second presentation, we would like to call on Dr. Marion D. Patricio from the Philippine Heart Center. Good day, colleagues. I will be presenting my research entitled Nutrition and Frailty Status of Patients Undergoing Cardiovascular Surgery and Its Association with Postoperative Outcomes. I am Dr. Marion Patricia from the Division of Critical Care Medicine, Philippine Heart Center. I have no disclosures. For the background of the study, malnutrition is nutrition imbalance as a result of overnutrition and undernutrition. Undernutrition is more common in critical illness due to lack of caloric intake. Critical illness also results to increased caloric requirements, poor nutrient absorption and utilization, and inflammation. Cardiovascular surgery post-operative patients admitted that intensive care are at an increased risk of malnutrition. Unique to cardiopulmonary bypass is the intensity of the inflammatory response, which may be aggravated by pre-existing malnutrition. The diagnosis of malnutrition results to a significant use of resources due to its complications. Malnourished patients who underwent cardiovascular surgery have increased risk of prolonged ventilation and nosocomial infections. This results to a prolonged hospital stay with a higher risk for mortality. Despite its effects, malnutrition prevalence is increasing across the world because of under-recognition and aging population. In the hospitalized elderly, malnutrition has a prevalence of 38%. In patients undergoing cardiac surgery, the prevalence is 46%. In one local study in a Baguio hospital, the prevalence was high at 73%. Due to differences with screening and diagnosis, the European Society of Parenteral Nutrition has convened to streamline the guidelines. A global leadership initiative on malnutrition criteria was formed. However, lack of validation for Asian populations precludes its widespread use. Nutrition Risk Screening, or NRS 2002, was endorsed by SPEN. NRS has been widely used and validated in Asian and cardiac surgery populations. It is composed of screening, assessment, and diagnosis. The following are used for screening. Nutrition Risk Assessment is then completed using the following graded criteria. 
mild to moderate malnutrition is diagnosed from a score of 1 to 2, while severe malnutrition is diagnosed from a score of 3 and above. Malnutrition is a central component of clinical frailty, which is a syndrome characterized by poor nutritional status, weakness, reduced cognitive function resulting to susceptibility to stressors. It is more common with aging individuals as a part of age-related decline. However, in contrast to aging, frailty is associated with increased inflammatory markers with higher odds of dying compared to non-frail individuals. Frailty has been recognized as a condition that affects cardiovascular surgery outcomes. Higher risk of complications arise with frail patients undergoing cardiovascular surgery. There are a number of validated frailty tools to screen and classify frailty. These resulted with differences in assessment of frailty measures, such as muscle strength, muscle volume, movement, cognitive decline, and activities of daily living. Special tools and imaging preclude routine assessment of in patients. Hence, the Canadian Society of Health and Aging developed the Clinical Frailty Scale, or CFS, as a simple interview tool for determining level of frailty. CFS is a nine-point exam with frailty being defined as a score of more than four. It involves history of patient's mobility, self-care, cognition, and activities of daily living. It is highly correlated to the more comprehensive frailty index and has been validated across various populations, including cardiac surgery patients. For the significance of the study, frailty has a high pool prevalence of 30% in a systematic review. For patients undergoing cardiac surgery, the odds ratio is 4.89 times for major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. Studies of frailty in developed countries involve old patients of more than 65 years old with delayed degenerative diseases. To date, there are no Philippine data on malnutrition and frailty in cardiovascular surgery patients. And also, there's limited data specifically addressing frailty in the younger adult. Hence, my general objective is to determine the in-hospital post-operative outcomes of adult patients with malnutrition and frailty admitted for cardiac surgery. And these are my specific objectives. For my POIOM, my research population involves adults 19 years old and above admitted for cardiovascular surgery. Intervention was malnutrition and frailty. Outcome was post-operative outcomes and method was prospective cohort. The study was conducted from October 2020 to February 2021. Online census was accessed daily for eligible patients. Adults, patients, 19 years old and above admitted for cardiovascular surgery were included. Excluded were those who refused to give informed consent and unable to answer questions from CFS or NRS. Once eligibility criteria was met, informed consent was obtained. Clinical profile was collected. NRS was used to determine nutrition status, and CFS was used to determine frail status. Patients then underwent cardiovascular surgery. Patients were followed up daily until outcomes of interest were observed until discharge. And these were the statistical analysis done. For the result, the total population was 111 with a mean age of 53 years old, 63% were male. Coronary artery bypass graft was the most common surgery followed by valve surgeries. Hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and heart failure were the most common comorbidities. This table compares two groups, no malnutrition versus malnutrition in the topmost row and the variables of interest in the leftmost column. The diagnosis of malnutrition was noted in 51% of patients admitted. Malnutrition was found in older patients with a mean age of 57 years old. Surgery for rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve, and multivalve surgery were significantly associated with malnutrition. Surgery for ASD had lower prevalence of malnutrition. Among comorbidities, heart failure, chronic kidney disease were significantly associated. Lymphopenia, lower total protein, and higher creatinine were lab data significant associated. This table divided patients into three groups, no frailty, at risk of clinical frailty in the topmost row, and the different variables on the leftmost column. 23% of the population had frailty, an additional 16% are at risk. Similar with malnutrition, age, RHD, mitral, and multivalve surgery are associated with frailty. On comorbidities, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, thyroid disorder were significantly associated. On lab data, lymphopenia and high creatinine were associated with frailty. 
This table shows the outcomes of interest on the leftmost column compared in between three groups in the topmost row, namely normal, malnutrition, and malnutrition with frailty. All patients with malnutrition, all patients with frailty have malnutrition, consistent with malnutrition being part of frailty syndrome. This puts them at higher odds for developing an outcome. We see that mortality, prolonged hospitalization, duration of mechanical ventilation, and nosocomial infections were prolonged with malnutrition and frailty. For the discussion, the prevalence of malnutrition is 51% in the study, higher compared to 46.4% reported by Lopez et al. A reason significant for this is a significant proportion of this population has RHD, which parallels higher prevalence of malnutrition in low to middle income countries. Another possible reason is that this study was done during COVID-19 pandemic with delays in elective surgeries resulting to prolonged symptoms of heart failure. Heart failure is a known risk factor for malnutrition, a well-described condition called heart failure cachexia. This also results to renal insufficiency compounding the effects of malnutrition. Combined malnutrition and frailty has an odds ratio of 7.8 times for mortality higher than reported by Unasawa et al. The prevalence of frailty in this study is 23% within the range for cardiovascular surgery populations of 4.1 to 46%. Mean age in this study is younger at 59 years old compared to systematic reviews of frailty in developed countries with age range of 65 to 79 years. Possible explanation include earlier onset of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with significant number of RHD occurring in younger adults. This reflects the epidemiologic transition of cardiovascular disease. The composite outcome for events in this study was 11.97 times, higher than the reported odds ratio in systematic review. The clinical implication, high prevalence of malnutrition and frailty, and its effects on post-operative outcomes is the importance of screening and management strengthening clinical pathways, and tailoring a specific nutrition therapy for these patients are, are recommended. Improving cardiac rehabilitation services and pathways in order to mitigate frailty syndrome cannot be overemphasized as it is associated with improved outcomes. And these are the limitations of the study. In conclusion, evaluation of nutrition and frailty status using NRS and CFS was helpful in predicting post-operative outcomes with a significant number of this population having malnutrition and frailty, there is a need to strengthen clinical pathways on perioperative nutrition and rehabilitation with the possibility of improving cardiovascular surgery outcomes. Thank you. And these are my references. Once again, thank you, Dr. Patricio, inter for your um, presentation re relative to the nutrition and frailty status of patients undergoing cardiovascular surgery. Um, for our next presentation, unfortunately, our presenter will not be available today, but we will be providing a recorded video of her presentation um, that will be followed um, shortly. So again, um, JJ, can you present the, the, the video already? Thank you. For the past decades, issues on population control have been raised. The government, Department of Health and Legislative have been addressing these issues for quite some time. However, on the other end of the spectrum on population control, the end users have seldom been asked understood and talked about. Catharsis Education Action, CEA method as adjunct to family planning education and the utilization of contraceptives among women of reproductive age, a randomized controlled trial. In 2015, the Philippines committed to help achieve the sustainable development goals formulated to succeed the MDGs established in 2000. SDG 3 aims to achieve universal health coverage for all, including the need for family planning. In 2017, the Department of Health stated that approximately 6 million women of reproductive age have unmet need for modern family planning. The contraceptive prevalence rate only attained a 2% increase in a span of five years. In our local setting, Komentang Ibaba is a populated urban barangay in Batangas City. 
the CRP was 40% last 2019 with negligible change in the past year. Despite all efforts, the unmet need in family planning still remains high. Research has documented barriers to acquiring family planning services. Studies suggest that addressing the psychosocial cultural concerns of these women may help improve acceptance to modern family planning. This study hypothesized that applying the CEA method among women with unmet need in family planning may help address barriers to contraceptive use. Thus, the main objective of this study is to compare the effectiveness of the CEA method with family planning education to family planning education alone in increasing the utilization rate of artificial contraceptive use among women of reproductive age in Kumintang Ibaba, Batanga City. Specifically, the study aimed to compare baseline social demographic characteristics of women with unmet need in the two groups and to compare proportions of women using artificial contraceptives. This two-arm open-labeled randomized controlled trial was conducted in a primary health center in Batanga City over a span of seven months. Sample size was 176 compu computed at 95% confidence level, assuming a 5% margin of error. Participants were women with unmet need in family planning who met the inclusion criteria as follows. After securing informed consent, a self-administered social demographic questionnaire was obtained. Number codes were used for each participant to ensure privacy and confidentiality. Simple random sampling was carried out among 176 women. 88 participants were randomly allocated into two arms. The intervention group involved CEA method in family planning education, while the control group involved family planning education alone. Family planning education was provided by the midwife in batches of 15 to 20 women after which individual one-on-one -on -one CEA counseling was conducted by the investigator to each participant assigned in the intervention arm. To elicit the participant's emotionally critical misperception, the three questions were asked. Ano ang naiisip mo kapag tinatanong ka tungkol sa paraan ng pagpipigil sa pagbubuntis? Ano ang naging damdamin mo noong naisip mo mga ito? Ano ang pinakadahilan? Bakit mo nararamdaman ito? The summary of the ECM then followed. Outcomes were obtained one month post-intervention. Participants were asked to complete a structured follow-up questionnaire to document the family planning method. Answers were then cross-checked with the family planning logbook at the health center. Data from 176 participants were included in the analysis. Majority of the respondents were 19 to 29 years old, high school graduates, Catholics, married with less than five-year cohabitation. More than half of the subjects in both arms had one to three living children and had no future pregnancy plans. There is no significant difference in the social demographic profile except for the participant's age. Table summarizes the uptake of artificial contraceptives in natural family planning one month post-intervention. There were no dropouts or exclusion of participants during the study period. Chi-square or Fisher exact test, whenever applicable, was used to compare proportions once held p-values were reported with a level of significance set at less than 0.05, a significant percentage of participants did not consider any type of contraceptive after the study. Results showed a statistically significant difference in the uptake of artificial contraceptives and natural family planning between the two arms. Comparing proportions of the type of artificial contraceptive use between the two groups were similar except in the uptake of progestin-only pills. Unique to the study is the incorporation of the CEA method to address the participants' concern that have been known to affect their contraceptive behavior. Those who underwent CEA counseling were more receptive to artificial contraceptives than those who underwent family planning education alone. In contrast, more of the participants who underwent family planning education alone adopted natural family planning methods. The inclusion of the CEA method to family planning services is advisable to understand the psychosocial context of women with unmet need. This study establishes the value of using CEA in family and community practice to promote family planning and uphold the well-being of women, their children, and their families. Effective family planning programs to address the unmet need would reduce population growth, elevate poverty, and further help families and communities attain a higher quality of life. Using simple and understandable terms, these ECMs were corrected in the education part of the CEA, 
addressing their concerns through a personalized counseling approach may have led to the positive acceptance towards artificial contraceptives. Research has well documented the positive impact of CEA in improving certain aspects of patient care. CEA was found to be beneficial in improving treatment adherence in pulmonary tuberculosis and hypertension. This study demonstrated further evidence of the benefits of the CEA method. However, these findings should be interpreted in the light of several limitations. The sampled population was limited to one barangay. This initial groundwork needs to be followed through to measure the utilization of artificial contraceptives over time. Also, the reason behind the type of artificial contraceptive of choice was beyond the objectives of this study. In conclusion, Catharsis education action method as adjunct to family planning education is effective in increasing the utilization rate of artificial contraceptive use among women with unmet need. It highlighted the client-centered counseling approach to address barriers and correct misperceptions that influence the uptake of family planning. The inclusion of CEA will strengthen and improve the quality of reproductive health services, enhance the health and well-being of women and their families, and consequently progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. It is recommended that a similar study be done involving other communities to raise the evidence of the benefit of the CEA on family, man, on, on family planning. There is also a need to conduct a longitudinal study focusing not only on attracting new users, but also assuring continued use of artificial family planning methods. The inclusion of the CEA method in existing reproductive health services in the community may be recommended to policymakers and advocates of family planning. Thank you and good day. All right, so again, thank you all for your presentation. So now um, we are going to the Q&A portion of this um session um a few uh our coordinator miss joanna joy Dico, has monitored our chat panel and selected at least one question for each of the presenters to answer um should there be any more questions to be submitted we'll try to answer them um if if we would have time after this series of questions so I will now be turning over the uh, question and answer portion to our coordinator, Ms. Joanna Joy Vico. Thank you, Dr. J. So uh, let's start the Q&A portion of this session. So first uh, first question will, would be for Dr. Alamilo. So the question is, um, what is the overall guidance in the current CTG relative to hemoperfusion to dialysis patient? And how will this affect the living CTG for COVID-19 treatment and management? So good afternoon. So for that, for the CTGs in the local setting, there are no recommendations for use of hemoperfusion. The use of hemoperfusion is only reserved in clinical trial settings, which we wanted to do uh, given more time. We wanted to do, uh, and if there are more patients, uh, seeing as uh, even now there's still uh, rises in the cases of COVID-19 with the Delta variant, uh, if we can rep recruit more patients and after finalizing these details, um, we, we will proceed to further studies uh, prospective studies in the use of hemoperfusion for our patients. So for now, even in other in other countries, even FDA and European nations, the use of hemoperfusion is only reserved in clinical trials and under emergency use authorization only. But um, in actual clinical settings. I think that a lot of uh, a lot nephrologists get a lot of referral for severe COVID-19 as part of usually salvage therapy for those non-responders to RMDesivir and tocilizumab. Uh, they usually get uh, hemoperfusion sessions. 
unfortunately, in the use of hemoperfusion is not standardized. I have experienced or seen patients with given only one or um, one or two sessions, but the small clinical trials really advocated for the use of a series of hemoperfusion. The least number of, of that series is in a, in one study done in Iran, which should benefit is at least two hemoperfusion, consecutive hemoperfusion sessions. Uh, before they before they see a reduction in in use of oxygen improvement in in hemodynamics so thank you dr paolo uh, uh, we can now proceed to dr marion patricio um, if it is okay to Dr. Patricia to open his video uh, while answering this question. Uh, the question is, um, at this point uh, of time, uh, at this point, uh, time is the scoring nutrition and frailty status screening being implemented as a facility. Ah, sorry, sorry. At this time, uh, is the scoring nutrition and frailty status yeah, screening being implemented, implemented as a facility standard? Um, and are there plans for this to be implemented in other areas? Um, for example, PHC as the National Specialty Center for Cardiovascular Care. Right. Thank you for that question. Uh, currently, the the, there are nutrition and cardiac rehabilitation services being done in our uh, inpatient patients undergoing surgery. But commonly, this has been affected by the COVID 19 pandemic by lack of face to face consultation. As well as uh, 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 the daily follow up of these patients with regards to their diet. So, and these are uh, some of the end effect of the uh, face to face and advice of the journeys, and as well as the, uh, I mean, to, to undergoing cardiac rehab and uh, and it takes a concerted effort for them to have improved outcomes. Ma may call, may, pa, yes, ma'am. Ah, sige. Pa, pa, pa. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patricia, for that answer. Sorry for so, that. Ma ma may, it's okay. All right. Okay. Um, JJ, do we have other questions um, raised to either of our participants? Um, so far, no, we do not have uh, any other questions. So, all right. Um, do we still have time for our um, audience to submit um, queries or questions? Pa? Yes. We still have um, actually 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay. So at this point in time, I think um, we would like to ask our attendees or the other participants to submit um, their questions um, through the chat box below so that we can um, throw them to our presenters right now. Here we'll give uh, at least um, a minute or two to get this um, question spawn. No? So um, if none, we're, we're going to proceed with the next um, session. So yeah. Po sa, uh, ano, presentation po at pag, um, pagsagot sa mga tanong po from our audience po. No? So just a quick summary of what we've been discussing this afternoon. So this section really provided the information about um, good clinical outcomes among dialysis patients who developed severe and critical COVID-19 that underwent chemoperfusion. Um, it was mentioned or it was noted that particularly um, there was an effect in the decrease in inflammatory markers, improved PF ratio, and reduction in the 28-day mortality. So these findings can actually serve as a good uh, or 
as a good um, starting off to or a starting point um, to discuss um, the updating or the the development of the current clinical practice guidelines for the for COVID nineteen management. We also heard about the benefits of conducting clinical frailty scale or assessment, nutrition and clinical frailty assessment as an additional screening as part of preoperative planning for patients undergoing cardiovascular surgeries. And of course, lastly, from the video um, presented a while ago, we have heard um, from, the, from our presenter how CEA method can be a potential adjunct treatment to increase the utilization of contraceptives among women of reproductive age. So a simple method that can be cascaded even to our primary care providers. So with that, um, maraming maraming salamat po for ano, attending this parallel session. And I think that that will be all for this session po no, on treatment or um, management of the clinical and public health track. Um, of the first National Hospital Re Research Forum. So with this, um, we would like to invite all the participants to log on to your to your next parallel session on this time. So as some of you are, are, are aware, there are around 30 papers out of the 60 presented in this forum that are in the running for the, for the price of the best research paper. The winner will be announced and awarded at the closing plenary session of this forum. We also expect all of you to join during that plenary session. So again, um, maraming maraming salamat po. And sorry, just before the uh, the first before proceeding to the closing or the um, closing of this meeting link. Um, the link to the post-activity evaluation form will be announced and posted. All of those, um, all those who will be able to fill up the online post-activity evaluation form will receive a certificate of attendance in return. So at this point in time, our parallel session has been concluded. And thank you for your participation.